I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. A little bit of a change this morning from our Corinthian study. But Acts chapter 8, we're going to look at the first eight verses of Acts chapter 8. But I want to, um, to first, um, we'll take a look, or in a moment we'll take a look at Acts chapter 1 verse 8. So if you want to flip over there, mark your spot, and then we'll come back. Many times in our Christian life we can make things a little bit harder than what they truly are. A Sunday school teacher was asking her children's class some questions about heaven. And, and one of the things she asked was, if I sold my house and my car, had a big garage sale, and gave all my money to the church, would that get me to heaven? And the kids answered, no. And so she asked, if I cleaned the church every day, mowed the yard, kept everything neat and tidy, would I get to heaven? And again, the kids answered no. She was feeling pretty good at this point about things. And, and so the teacher then asked, well, how can I get to heaven? Now she was hoping the answer would be through Jesus Christ. But instead, a boy from the back shouted, you got to be dead. Sometimes we make things a little more difficult than what they truly are in life, I guess. But we do know through Christ, uh, heaven is attainable through the grace and mercy we receive through Him. Today, we want to uh, not make sharing the gospel hard, but we want to look at, at uh, an event in the early history of the church here recorded in Acts. And and uh, as we think about our life today compared to then, uh, we do find some differences, but we also find some similarities. One of the things that has been noted over the last few years, and, and this seems somewhat discouraging, but maybe it's also a challenge, is that uh, a study done a few years ago actually estimated that it required 1,000 laypersons and six ministers one year to lead one person to Christ. So a thousand lay people and six ministers, a period of time, now actually they averaged all this out, that's where they come up with the number. But when you think about that, that's not a real successful conversion rate. It was estimated at that time that 95% of Christians actually never lead a soul to Christ. Now we know it's Christ that does the saving, it's not us. But we also know that they have to hear it from somewhere as well. Now this should actually beg us to, to ask this question, is this the way that God intended or planned for it to be? If you've ever worked for a company at some point in your life, you may have had an evaluation by your manager and maybe during that time you were asked, or they were given to you some goals for you to accomplish throughout the year. I wonder if each of us as a follower of Christ were to identify what our life goal would be. Would it be a statement similar to this or would it be something much different? Would it be a statement such as, I want to be a fully committed follower of Jesus Christ and participate in making Christian disciples? See, we've lived in a country, and we're thankful for it, where we have freedoms to be able to go out and try and achieve or accomplish whatever we would want. We sometimes call that the American dream, where we have this house, and we have two kids, and we have a car, vehicle to get around in. But that American dream, thought, and idea has really damaged the Christian church. And it's damaged it in a way that it's taken our attention off of what should be our primary goal in life, which is to glorify God and to bring others unto a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And if that's not part of our life goal, then somewhere along the way, we failed to actually make Jesus Christ the Lord of our life. And instead, we've made something else the Lord of our life, possibly the American dream. If we look back, and if you were to go backwards and look at the first seven chapters of Acts, you'll find at least four examples where the believers in Jerusalem, the early church, could have went astray from what God actually instructed them to do. 
We see that Satan was trying to prevent the early church from accomplishing what God had in mind. Four of those examples are Peter and John being arrested and told not to preach. Now, Peter and John was not going to give in to that. They continued to preach. They were not going to bow down to what Satan had wanted to try and uh, put an end to. You also have Ananias and Sapphira. This was actually an internal issue within the church where there was deceit that was going on, and because of that, there was life lost. You have the apostles being arrested and told not to preach. Not just Peter and John, but at a later time, the apostles were arrested. They were told not to preach. This was actually a worldly persecution that came upon them. And then within, you had the Hellenists complaining about the widows not being served, which was actually an internal issue. And at that point, you had the appointment of what we today would call deacons in order to serve and, and uh, care for widows. and But yet in all of those cases, Satan was trying to put a stop to what God was accomplishing through people. And I want you to note that, that, that the success of this early church was not Christ Himself walking here. Now obviously He had laid all the groundwork and He had made the way for salvation to occur. But the success of the early church was accomplished because there were people willing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And without that willingness of the people, then how would they have heard? In each of the situations we talked about, the church actually stayed on course as followers of Christ. They continued to preach. Whether they knew it or not, they were actually fulfilling the first part of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And I want you to turn there if you're not. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, which was Christ's instruction as recorded by Luke in the first chapter at the time of His ascension. Now we, we commonly refer to Matthew 28 as the great commission that Christ gives. We also find here recorded in Acts 1.8, also from Luke's perspective, the words of Christ right before He ascended. And in verse 8 it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Probably a verse you've heard several times in your life, but I want to just give you a glimpse of what Christ was trying to relate to them. As He speaks of them being witnesses, He first mentions Jerusalem, which is their local place, their place that they lived in at that point in time. When He speaks of Judea and Samaria, He speaks of a, a broader range, more of what we might think of today as a state an area that's much larger than just the city that we live in. And then as He speaks of to the end of the earth, He speaks of taking the gospel around the world. Christ's instruction, His challenge, let's put it this way, His blueprint or His goal was to see people such as you and I be willing to take the gospel to every facet and every corner of the earth including where we live. Now flip over back, if you will, to chapter 8 in Acts, and we're going to see this actually in action. Chapter 8, verse 1. And we find a point in time, this is right before, or not long before, Saul's conversion. Saul, as we know to be Paul later, but Paul that we've been studying as he writes to the Corinthian church this is a period of time right before his conversion. At that point he was uh, going by the name of Saul at that time. But in chapter 8 verse 1 we find where Saul actually assisted at the stoning of Stephen. Now Stephen was the first martyr in New Testament that we have recorded. And so we find this event being recorded right at the end after he was stoned in verse eight, or chapter 8 verse 1 says, and Saul approved of his execution. That seems like a very simple sentence, but it speaks deeply to who Saul was at that point in time. He approved of the execution. 
It goes on, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And he'd done that because they believed in Jesus Christ. Verse 4, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Now Philip here is not the Apostle Philip. This is Philip, a layperson within the early church. And I say that to say it was not always the apostles that were going out and sharing the gospel. It's important for us to know that because that applies then to our life today that it's not always the preachers or the deacons or the Sunday school teachers that are going out and sharing the gospel. It is the responsibility of all people to go into all the world and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We find it here today as an example that's being lived out of what Christ proclaimed in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, the blueprint that He gave. He told them that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit and they would be His witnesses. The ministry so far, as we read here in chapter 8, the ministry so far had been in Jerusalem. They had been comfortable sharing the gospel right in their hometown, if you want to call it that. A very close circle. And they had seen great things happen. But they were also very comfortable staying there. The apostles and other believers in Jerusalem could have been content to continue to minister in that same place. It was probably comfortable for them to stay there. They didn't have to move. They lived in their own home, slept in their own bed, if you want to say that, every night. It wasn't as if it was a hardship for them to get up, go somewhere else, leave their job behind, and begin sharing the gospel abroad. Now I bring this to your attention because if we're not cautious, this same thing can happen today. We can become very content with sharing the gospel in our little circle of life, whatever that may be. It may be your own household. It may be within your own church. It may be just around the people that you work with, which those are all important. I'm not saying that they are not. They are extremely important. But at the same time, there are people around the world and around the city and around the state who still need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can sometimes as a church become focused on within even to the point that, that we focus on discipleship just within our church, which is important. I'm not saying it's not. It is absolutely important. But it can't be our only focus. Because there's also a lost and dying world out there that needs to hear about the gospel, that also needs to become saved, as we call it, accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and they need to become attached to a church so that they can then be discipled. But somehow they have to hear about it. See, the church must take an active role in all phases of the calling or the blueprint that Christ left in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Sometimes we get hung up on where. Like where has God called me to be this example? Where has He called me to be this witness? And we get so hung up on the where that we just kind of forget the, what we're really supposed to do. You see, it's not always about the where. It's about us being willing to be uncomfortable. Now, we enjoy comfort today. 
Some of you may be a little bit warm right now. You may be a little bit cool. I don't know which way you are. But at the same time, you're not sitting in 40 or 45 degree weather outside either. We enjoy the comfort of a warm place. You're not sitting on a bucket. You're not sitting on a metal folding chair. You're sitting on a pew that has cushion padding both bottom and back. You drove here not in a wagon or riding a horse or walking, but you drove here in a vehicle that if some of you ladies were lucky, your husband went out and started and warmed up for you before you came to church. But it got warm probably before you got here, regardless. We had plenty of clothes to wear, probably plenty to eat before we came if we took the time to do it. Now, you may not have taken the time. That's not on me, so if I go late, it's your fault you didn't eat before you came. We enjoy comfort. But when we read here in the early church, do we find that these people enjoyed comfort to the point that it prevented them from going and sharing the gospel? Or do we find them being willing to be uncomfortable so that the accomplishment of God's blueprint actually happens? You see, in America, we are so comfortable, we don't even understand what the world around us even lives in. Could you imagine if one of us got transplanted today into the Ukraine? We wouldn't know what to do. Now, they live in an area, I'm not saying that they always live among fighting, but they live in an area where they know it's a possibility. We live in an area where we don't worry. We do, but we don't about that. Some of you may not even lock your doors at night because you're not concerned. Life is easy, although we think it's hard. But if we transplant it into some other cultures, we would probably find that we live a life of comfort. Now, is that wrong for us to do? You know, God has blessed us, okay? I'm not saying that it's wrong for us to live in that. What I'm saying is God does not always call us to a life of comfort. He calls us to go and share the gospel wherever He needs us to share the gospel. We must be willing to be uncomfortable for Him so that others might know the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And if we're not willing to be uncomfortable for that, then we've lost who the Lord of our life is. And maybe we need to regain that. We find today the introduction of an individual who was appointed actually, to, as we said, he was actually appointed as one of the, the deacons or the elders in the early church. He was appointed to serve tables, but yet at the same time, he wasn't afraid to actually go and share the gospel. And we didn't really talk about this, but where he went would actually be to go and share the gospel with what the Jews would term dogs, Gentiles, Samaritans actually. But he went to a place where the Jewish people did not associate with because they considered them unclean. So it wasn't just that he left Jerusalem to go do this. It was that he left an area, his home, to go to a place that God had obviously sent him to, and it was a place where he, in his former life as a Jew, would not have even went. This could have been his very first trip into Samaria. Now, there are places in this world that we would not want to travel, probably. But the question we must ask ourselves is, if God called us to travel there to share the gospel, would we do it? We find in Philip a man that was on a mission. As we spoke about this individual by the name of Saul, who would later become Paul after his conversion... He became a great messenger, Saul did. But here we could say that he was actually Satan's at least fifth attempt to put a stop to the followers of Christ. Now we don't think about someone such as Paul 
in his former life actually being used by Satan to try and accomplish what Satan's trying to accomplish, but he was. And it begs us to ask the question too, if we don't go where God calls us to go, if we don't speak to who God calls us to speak to, then whose instrument are we being? Are we being an instrument of God at that point? Or are we falling in line with Satan's attempt to stop the gospel and the spread of the gospel? You see, the believers in the church had a decision to make, especially after Stephen was stoned. And we find that individuals like Philip took part in continuing to follow that blueprint that Christ had given in Acts 1.8. He went to Samaria prior to this. We had seen times where the church would have great number of followers that would become believers, but it was within Jerusalem primarily. As we look back throughout history, maybe in our lifetime or before, we've seen people being willing to humble themselves and, and become obedient. And what that would lead to in life would typically be, not always, but would sometimes be some great revivals that would occur, especially here in the Americas. D.L. Moody speaks of a time when he was on vacation in England, and he was preaching for a pastor by the name of Lessie in, in London on a Sunday morning. And he was scheduled to preach in that Sunday evening service as well, but he became very discouraged after the Sunday morning service because the people seemed so cold. There was no response. They were just kind of going through the motions of being there. And so he became extremely discouraged, and, and he considered canceling for that evening, but he didn't. And when he got there that night, he found that the evening service was actually more packed in attendance than what it was that morning. And so he preached, and at the conclusion, he gave an invitation. And he asked the people to stand up if they wanted to become a Christian, and he said dozens of people stood up. And Mr. Moody thought that maybe they misunderstood him, because this was a crowd that had been so cold that morning, and now this evening are actually standing up wanting to be believers or followers of Christ. And so he asked them to sit back down. And he told them somewhat nervously, but he told them if they wanted to accept Christ, to meet him in a room after service. He designated the room, and after service was dismissed, he went to the room, and what he found was dozens of people had gathered there in the room, wanted to become believers in Christ. Moody said that the power of God was so strong that he stayed and he preached another 10 days, and over 400 ended up getting saved. But he was so interested in, in how this happened. He knew something had happened that afternoon. And he knew that typically something like this only occurred in response to prayerfulness. And so he began researching everything that happened that afternoon among some of the people that were in the church. And what he found was that there was one elderly lady whose sister was physically unable to attend. This elderly lady went to her sister's house after the morning service and had prepared lunch and she was telling her sister about everything that happened that morning, how the crowd just seemed cold even to her. And so her sister, the one that was unable to attend, said, put lunch away. We're spending the afternoon in prayer. And they prayed all afternoon. And that night, there was a much different crowd that showed up. Same people, but a much different crowd. And it begs us to ask the question, are we willing to put lunch away? Now, I've mentioned that some of you are probably thinking about what you're going to eat, right? But are we, would we be willing to put lunch away and stay after church and pray all afternoon for an evening service? Or are we even eat, willing to go eat and then come back and pray?
What if today we are the one with the, the mission that God has? And because of a, a faithfulness that could be found in each one of us, great things could be accomplished for the kingdom of God, but we're just not willing to put lunch away. You see, we could actually become Saul instead of Paul. And we could be hindering the work of God instead of advancing the kingdom. I also read a story that F.B. Meyer wrote about an unsuccessful revival that drug on night after night with no visible results. And after several nights, a deacon came forward to say that he knew why this revival had been so unsuccessful. And Mr. Meyer was interested in hearing what the deacon had to say because he didn't know what was going to be said. And the deacon went on to say that he had held a grudge against another deacon and they had not spoken in months. There was bad blood, you might say, between the two. So Mr. Meyer got them together and led them in bearing the hatchet, forgiving each other, asking for forgiveness, and they made it public before the next service. And after that, revival broke out that very night and people committed themselves to following Christ. You see, we can be the one who advances the gospel of Christ, or because of unrepentant sin in our life, we can be the one that hinders the advancement of the gospel of Christ. Philip was not going to be quiet about Christ. The crowds listened to him. You see, it matters what message that Philip was willing to deliver as well. So going back to verse 4. Notice what Philip preached. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the Word. Now that means preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in its truth and entirety. Philip could have went and talked about how bad things were among the Jewish leadership he could have complained about all the work that the church was expecting of him by asking him to, to wait on tables for the widows. But what we see is he proclaimed Christ and the people heard him. And they acted in obedience to what Christ was leading them to do in their life. Now sometimes we find that, that people will listen to about half of what we say. I read a story of a minister who was actually preaching on the subject of hell. And an elderly man had, had fallen asleep in service. And, and so the minister got to the end of his service, uh, sermon and uh, he asked if there was anyone that wanted to go to hell to stand up. Well, this elderly man heard stand up and did not hear the other part of the statement. And so he stands up and he looks around and he's the only one standing. Still not knowing what the minister asked, he finally spoke up and he said, Pastor, I don't know about these other people, but it looks like me and you are the only ones going. <laughs> True story, I was actually, it was a Mother's Day and I was in service, and I asked all of the mothers to stand up. And there was a, a gentleman in the crowd that because his wife stood up, he just stood up. And he was standing there loud and proud. And uh, so I asked him, I said, uh, is there something I need to know? He said, no, I was just standing up because she told me to. <laughs> she really didn't tell him to. He thought she nudged him to stand up, and she didn't. But you know, sometimes we listen to about half of what is said. Just like sometimes we only hear part of what is said about proclaiming the gospel. And sometimes we only proclaim a piece of the story. Now I want you to think back through some events in the Bible. Go back to Noah, if you would, in Genesis. And from what you remember of Noah, do you remember Noah standing on the steps of the ark and saying, something good is going to happen to you? 
No, you don't. What you find is that Noah proclaimed repentance. Jeremiah was not put into the pit for preaching, I am okay and you are okay. He was put into the pit because he preached repentance. John the Baptist was not forced to preach in the wilderness and eventually be beheaded because he preached, smile, God loves you. And the two prophets spoken of in Revelation will not be uh, killed for preaching, God is in His heaven and all is right with the world. But we find these statements being proclaimed today. They are half-truths, but they are wooing and charming some people into believing that is what God stands for. We're proclaiming part of the gospel without giving the truth of the gospel. The true message is that we all must repent. We are all sinners and we are all in need of a Savior. No matter who we are and no matter what we've done, we all need Jesus Christ in our life. He is the only way to the Father. As messengers, we must preach that gospel. We must proclaim Christ in all that we do and everywhere that we go. That one message must be clear. And the result we see in verse 8 of our text, so there was much joy in the city. You want to bring joy into an individual's life, then you bring Christ into their life. Now yes, they're going to be humble because they're going to realize that there's a need for repentance in their life, but after they repent, you know what happens? There is a joyful life ahead of them because they know that Christ died on the cross for them. He loved them that much to do that. Because they've repented and called, out, or called upon His name, they now have an eternal reward in heaven that they will one day get to experience. There's joy in that. But you know, there's things that go on around us that, that we need to find joy in as well. When someone accepts Christ, do we become joyous about that event? Hopefully you're going to say yes. When parents commit themselves to raising their child or children in the ways of God, do we respond with joy? Like is there an overwhelming feeling within us that, yes, someone else believes in Christ, they're following Christ? You know, sometimes we struggle to find these joyous things about our own life. We miss the blessings of God because we don't realize what He's done. I wonder how long it's been since we've thanked God truly. And I'm not talking about in a passing statement, but I'm talking about truly thanked God for the forgiveness that He has given us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Or have we went through the motions of life and let everything else just drag us down? To the point that we look at what's going on in the world and we become so depressed, we become so anxious about it that we can't even enjoy the forgiveness we have through Jesus Christ. You see, God is still on His throne. He still deserves our respect. He deserves the glory that we give Him. And it's not by us being downtrodden all the time that we're expressing glory to God. It is by us being joyous about what He has done in our life and others that God receives glory. But if we fail to do that, we're not bringing glory to Him. So where is our joy today? We must ask ourselves also, what does it mean to be a committed follower of Christ? And I hesitate to use that word committed, and I don't think I typed it on the slide. And there's a reason for that, because sometimes we, we talk about being a follower of Christ, and then we say a fully committed follower of Christ. But there really is no difference between those two. Like, we're either a follower of His or we're not. You can't be like a, just a little bit of a follower, and then one day I'm going to become a fully committed follower of Christ. You either follow Christ or you're not. He speaks of it in the church of Laodicea when he says, 
I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I spew you out of my mouth. I don't think any of us want to be at that spot where we're spewed out of the mouth of Christ. So our relationship must be solid with Him. It must be true. The first step, though, to all of that is we have to realize that we need a Savior, Jesus Christ. That without Him, we can't accomplish anything. Without Him, we have a physical death to face, and we have an eternal death to face. But with Him, yes, we still go through the physical death, but after that is eternal life. And we will be in the presence of God, the one who spoke this world into existence, the one who created us from the dust of the earth, the one who sent His Son to die upon the cross so that we would not perish, but all who believe would have everlasting life. That is the Savior. That is the God that we can have eternal life with. It all begins there. And after that, when we realize the joy of coming out of the terrible person that we were because of sin, and we realize that God has cleansed us through His Son, after that, we begin finding joy in others' life as well. But it begins with us accepting Christ. So I would ask you today, is your life right with the Savior of the world? And if not, why not today? Why put it off another day? Why say, you know, there'll be another time, there'll be some other place, there'll be another day for me to accept Christ as my Savior? Why not today? Maybe you're here Maybe you accepted Christ at some point in your life, but maybe you failed to see the joy in others accepting Christ. Maybe you've struggled with, with just being an individual who is on mission to proclaiming Christ. Maybe God has called you somewhere, called you to speak to someone. Maybe He's moving in your heart right now. Will you respond and say, I'll go? Or will you say, there'll be another day? There'll be another time. Because you see, we then have to ask ourselves a question of, are we being a hindrance to the proclamation of the gospel? Are we being Saul instead of Paul? See, our failure to go when we are called, when we are truly called, our failure to go is sin in our life because it's being disobedient to God. We don't think about having to repent of like our not just going or not just talking to someone that God has placed in our life to talk to. But yet it's sin. Maybe today there's unconfessed sin in our life because of our failure to speak to someone that God has placed in our life for us to speak to. Maybe we've not been honest. Maybe we've not been truthful in things. Maybe we're holding a grudge that we need to forgive, such as the, the deacon in the example. Or maybe we've just bogged ourselves down with worries and concerns of this world to the point that we are not an effective witness for God because all people see is our anxiety and our fears and our worries. And yet there is so much joy for us to have. A Savior that loved you so much to come and give His life for you. A Savior that invested in 11, 12 guys that walked on the face of the earth and then continued to share the gospel so that you and I today would have it. He's gifted you with even the gift of His Word that you may have in your lap today or you have on your phone or you have at home, wherever you have it. But He's gifted you with that, something that will help us through life. But do we find joy in it? Do we find joy in studying it? Do we find joy in gathering together like we are this morning? 
coming together, singing songs, watching children who are singing their hearts out for the glory of God. Hopefully you leave here today with a joy in your heart. Not a fear of what's going on in the world around you, but a joy that can only be had through the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. This morning, if you don't have that relationship, we want to invite you to find it today through the Son, Jesus Christ. As we stand together, our musicians come. We ask you to bow your heads in prayer with us at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for this day you've given us. Lord, knowing that true joy in our life can be found through you. But Lord, also knowing that struggles as they come into this life can be faced with joy as well when we have you at the center of our life. So Lord, maybe today you're calling out to someone that's here. Maybe it's someone watching online. You're calling out to them for them to be obedient just to your blueprint for their life. So this morning, Lord, we pray that they would be obedient. And Lord, maybe if they need to repent of things in their life today, that they would do so. Lord, we thank you that you are a God that is patient with us, that is full of grace and mercy. But Lord, also we know that you are a righteous God. And there's coming a day when you will tell your son it's time. And so we're thankful for the opportunity that you've given us this morning. And Lord, we just pray that we be obedient. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. As we sing a verse of invitation.